What is this thing about adapting European properties for Western audiences and then setting them in their original countries and forcing the cast to put on accents? I mean, can you imagine if they'd set The Departed in Hong Kong and had that cast put on silly accents? Be offensive, right? It really would. So, spare a moment and think of the Swedish as you watch this. Actually, it's, it's not bad. It's probably the best one out of all of these, you know, European snowy thriller things. <laughs> The Spider's Web is what's being called a soft reboot, or just an outright reboot. -quel. It's an adaptation of the fourth novel in the series that began with Stieg Larsson's Millennium Trilogy, but it's actually the first book in that whole canon to be written by someone else instead. Lisbeth Sander, who's now played by Claire Foy, because what movie isn't she in this year, if we're honest, she's now become a straight-up avenging angel for abused women, basically serving as a sort of vigilante who punishes toxic men by incapacitating them and stealing all their swag and giving it to their victims as recompense. She's then hired by a computer programmer, played by uh, Stephen Merchant, who's, uh, who's after a program he's designed that's been taken away from him and he thinks has the potential to cause all sorts of evil, because it turns out that program allows you to take control of nuclear weapons. Why do they make these things? Really? Why? It's like Resident Evil. Who needed a virus that turned people into zombies? Who? Anyway, so going after this program puts Lisbeth Sander right square in the crosshairs of a particularly vigorous NSA agent who's played by Lakeith Stanfield and also puts her also in the crosshairs of a group of murderous cyber criminals led by her believed to be dead and previously unmentioned sister, played by Blade Runner 2049, Sylvia Hoax. Uh, here's a clip. You know I tried. I really promise I have tried. I just do not get the appeal of this whole snowy Euro thriller thing. I mean, they obviously make decent bank eventually, like when they hit home platforms, etc. But they're always bocked off its underperformers. And it'd take a pretty sick mind to look at something like The Snowman and think, yes, more like this, please. More. No, no, that is, that is not, that's not right thinking at all. God, do you remember The Snowman? God, that sucked. Anyway, uh, this is straight up the most fun any of these kind of movies have been so far, and I am including the original Swedish trilogy when I say that, by a wide margin. Obviously the big joy here is that it's Claire Foy as Lisbeth, and she's just had the biggest year, so this kind of becomes her big mainstream franchise role, the sort of cherry on top, which is fair enough, and it's a really good pull for her. She brings a lot of warmth to this, like more warmth, more depth, more nuance than either Numi Pace or Rooney Mara ever did, and she gives pretty great side eyes. She zips sort of seamlessly from like a hardcore coding sesh to, you know, a requisite bullet-ridden action sequence. Uh, they have this, this new trick in the Arsenal too, whereby they effectively stack all of her hacks on top of one another, and she winds up rigging like the separate parts of an entire building so that she can just have them spring to life as and when needed, like on cue. And the whole thing makes her seem like this sassy, edgy female Rick Sanchez. And to be fair, Claire Foy absolutely makes that fly. Like I wouldn't have thought it, but yeah, turns out best live action Rick Sanchez, Claire Foy as Elizabeth Sounder. Hmm. 
Also really good here is uh, Sveria Goodnesson, who I think most of us probably know for having played Bjorn Borg in Borg McEnroe last year. He was pretty great in that, and he's pretty great here too. Uh, there's a, a newly discovered sort of more human streak uh, they've added to the sort of Michael Blomqvist character. Is it Blomqvist? I'm going with Blomqvist. Uh, more human streak they've added to Blomqvist uh, here. And uh, Goodnesson plays it to perfection. I mean, particularly any scene he shares with Vicky Creeps. I mean, she's amazing, he's amazing, they have great chemistry. Kind of wish there was more of her in there, but apparently there are more books after this one, so I guess we can look forward to that coming. Um, he gets quite an insightful arc, though, here. I mean, there's an arc that sort of just deals with why he's so ready to leap into action with Elizabeth every time she sends a text, and how their escapades kind of define him, like, personally and professionally. I could have taken a lot more of that, to be honest. Uh, but what's there already kind of lands. You got a pretty great supporting cast, meanwhile. Stephen Merchant delivers the goods in that sort of Stephen Merchant y way. And Cameron Britton, who, you know, is the only thing anyone remembers about that Netflix series Mindhunters, let's be honest. Uh, he's a pretty neat little added value element here. I mean, I'd argue Lakeith Stanfield is kind of taking on a bit of a stock role here. I mean, he hits the beats, but he deserves a better part than this. I mean, he over delivers it to the extent that, you know, he pulls it off, but. You know, we're less than a month out from sorry to bother you, so, you know, we can kind of keep it in our pants till then, I guess. You'll see this guy rock soon enough. I was quite let down by Sylvia Hoax as the villain, though. After seeing her pretty much weaponize the whole icy cool thing in Blade Runner, I don't know, I was expecting something more, I guess, from her turning up in this? On balance, it works, I suppose, but it's a very understated part that just feels sort of inadequate, the side of Claire Foy and how she's reinvented Elizabeth Salander. Kind of wanted more. I kind of wanted a performance with a villain that matched the performance, you know, at least in terms of ambition and scale, and didn't quite get it. I mean, it is essentially the replicant performance again, only now it's in Sweden and it's in English. So, yay, I guess? On the soft reboot side, they're kind of treating this whole endeavor like it's a sort of full-blown part two to the whole Daniel Craig, Rooney Mara one that David Fincher turned out. Um, fair enough, they'd always planned to make that as a trilogy, and it's been six years and nobody sort of involved in that first one seems to want to come back. David Fincher is a producer on this, by the way. I didn't know that. Turns out he is. Um, but, you know, enough time has passed. Nobody really remembers the first one. Why not skip to the reboot? Why not, Zoidberg? It's pretty much the case that they just periodically refer back to previous events that have taken place in the continuity but haven't actually been depicted, you know, on the screen. Which is a bit of a problem, because, I mean, if you've seen the Swedish trilogy with Numi Rapace, you'll probably know the exploits they're referring to, but for me, having come only from the Fincher movie, it just felt like I was, like, jumping into the middle of a TV show and they kept throwing out, like, mythology references that I just didn't get. I mean, like, imagine if you, like, start watching Breaking Bad, like, three seasons in and you only saw the first one and you don't know any of season two. That's, that's kind of what you're getting here. It is not a deal breaker and it doesn't absolutely destroy the enjoyment, but, you know, it is an issue and it is there. You know, can't be helped. More importantly, though, Fede Alvarez is there and, my God, is he the man? Seriously. He's coming off of that uh, Don't Breathe last year. That was just, that was incredible, wasn't it? It was like two years ago, Don't Breathe. And uh, so he's jumped into this one. It seemed like an odd choice to begin with, but then you see the movie, you're like, okay, this this absolutely tracks. I get why you have done this. Um, he's got a great eye for creating really great imagery, like just amazing frames, like, funnily enough, kind of like Blade Runner 2049 did. Um, there's just some astonishing visuals in there. They top anything Fincher chucked in that first one, although, you know, there's noticeably like a hundred percent less Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song in there. Um, but the visuals that are there, as wonderful as they are, they are brought brilliantly to life by uh, Pedro Luke, who is the cinematographer on Don't Breathe. Seriously, this movie is slick as hell. I mean, it's not particularly memorable, it's kind of engaging in a way that none of these snowy thrillers have yet quite managed, Though I am a fan of In Order of Disappearance, I must admit, really like Stone Scar's Garden there. Uh, but it's just, just not a film that you can see on a Friday night and still absolutely remember the plot of when your workmates ask about it on Monday morning, you know? It's noticeably less interested in the sort of ponderous tedium that these things usually hang their hats on. And that is really, that's like an extra star from me purely for that, because these things can get really tedious. 
really ponderous. This one, less so. More like a schlocky thriller. Kind of like that about it. It's just not quite there as regards being that good that you really remember it. I mean, comparatively, think about that, that sort of, you know, schlocky reboot of Alex Cross they turned out a few years ago. Think of that, make it about 25% better, and a white chick. That's basically this movie. Where it does succeed, though, funnily enough, is in making the character of Elizabeth Salander just a touch more culturally relevant than she's been. It pans out that in the Me Too era, a leather-clad pansexual avenging angel figure is kind of a really investable lead for a movie. I mean, it seems like a really obvious choice, but none of us kind of cottoned on that that's why they might be doing this movie. So, that one worked out. Big thumbs up, by the way, uh, for them letting her stay the lead this time and not having them, not having her give up like half the runtime just because you got Bond and he needs to be on the poster. That kind of annoyed me. But, uh, you know, she's actually the lead here and she's compelling and she's interesting and she's more for our time and it really works. It's a solid three stars for me. I wouldn't mind seeing more of these so long as it's this level of sort of pacing and this level of reduced tedium, definitely. Uh, as long as that remains the standard, I am in. Apparently there are more books, like I say. I don't know anything about them. I'm sure Elizabeth Sander has like a long lost cousin. She's not mentioned either and they could be a villain. Uh, I'm not gonna remember specific details about this come Monday morning, I can tell you that much. I did like it though. So another movie out this week is uh, Postcards from London, which is this really otherworldly movie uh, from Steve McLean. Uh, and it stars uh, Harris Dickinson, who was from uh, Beach Rats last year. Really great movie, really great performance in that movie. He's back, he's in this, it's a bit artsy. It's about a young man who moves to London to quote unquote, pursue his dreams, uh, only to fall in with the raconteurs, who are like this group of exclusive rent boys who specialize in high-end art-based pillow talk. I know this sounds deranged, but it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, the crux is, of course, that our lead uh, has a unique condition, whereby he faints every time he's exposed to art. Imagine that. It's pretty out there. The whole thing's shot on a stage. It's got a kind of period non-specificity that winds up making it feel like you're watching a, a play being performed on the set of Blur's Country House video, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I really dug it, and it held my interest. It's not a wonderful film. It's gonna put a lot of people off. It's a bit out there for some, uh, but it's one with a healthy dash of like twisted imagination, and it's way better than sort of the similarly pitched Make Me Up which came out a couple of months ago, and uh, yeah, never see that movie. Never ever see Make Me Up. If anyone, for some reason, ever offers to show you that movie, punch them in the face and run away. You will thank me. But see Postcards from London, that's not bad. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, rate, and review.